Praise the Lord. Amen. They got pretty quiet in here. I thought, man, be still and know that he is God has taken place right now. Amen. You all having a good week? I hope. Amen. I'm having a great week, and I hope you all are. <coughs> I welcome our visitor uh, tonight. Uh, Stacy's back, but she's brought a visitor with her. Uh, Christine is her name. So if you didn't get a chance to say hi to her, say hi to her. Amen. She's 15, and uh, she goes to church in Georgia, so she's a church girl. Amen. <laughs> All right. I, uh, before we get uh, started, uh, I'd just like us all to stand up, and let's just say a prayer. Amen. Amen. I got a couple of names here I want us to pray for, and uh, Sister Stacy has had some seizures that have returned. So it'd be nice if we could get uh, some some folks up here to pray for her. Amen. Uh, the Bible says to call the elders of the church and uh, have them anoint you with oil. Amen. Come on up here, Brother Kenny. And we'll do that here in just a minute. Now, Stacy, you know that God is a working miracle God. Amen. I'm pretty sure he wants you in church. Amen. I think you'd agree. That's, that's where we should be, amen? Amen. And uh, we're going to address these seizures. We're going to call them seizures. And we're going to call on the name of Jesus Christ. I feel like this thing is trembling already. The Bible says just at the name, the devil trembles. Okay. I believe seizures are spirits. I don't for one minute think it's anything else. And those spirits know that I know that. So it don't have a choice today. It's going to have to leave this Holy Ghost filled body. He's trembling right now, but I feel a peace coming over you right now. It's going to saturate you and you're going to begin to feel nice and warm. And God that we serve, he's going to reach down from the throne and he's going to touch you. If there's anybody in here that don't believe that's going to happen, I'm going to ask you kindly to step out of the church. She came to the heavenly physician tonight. I've seen God do too, way too many things not to do this. I would say this to you right now, Sister Stacy. Make a commitment to God right now as we lay hands and pray on you. Make a commitment. And listen, he's a God that looks down the road. And he knows if you're going to keep it. So you can't fool God. That devil's trembling right now. Seizures are going to leave your body. You know they've left it before. we get done here we've got a few others to pray for that are not here but let's all say a prayer of repentance right now okay we've all had some thoughts today that weren't right and we've all maybe even said something today that wasn't right but I want to clear the slate because we need to come to the throne clean and pure we need to be clean without spot or wrinkle if I'm going to ask God to do something, I'm going to come to the throne boldly because that's the God that I serve. Father, right now, each and every one of us stand here before you. 
transparently, God, asking for you to forgive us right now. Forgive us, Lord, of our trespasses, of the things that we know that we do, Lord, and the things that we don't know that we did today, God. I need a quickening God spirit today, right now, and I know you're the one to do it. Father, I thank you for forgiving us right now. Now I'm going to ask you kindly to open up the windows of heaven and pour down a blessing right now, God. Let your healing power and authority be manifested tonight in this service. I love you, Lord. I've seen you raise the dead, God. I've seen you take terminal and make it permanently safe. In the name of Jesus, Father, right now, let's lay hands on our saint. By the authority of your word and the power that is in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Father, right now, I'm asking you to touch Stacy. I'm asking you, Lord, to go deep. I'm asking you, God, to make this simple. We don't need a special prayer, God. It's not in the oil, God. It's in the name. Father, right now, I command spirits of seizures to leave this body. I command them right now, God. I command them by the authority of your word and the power in the name of Jesus Christ. I call them out right now. Seizures, you got to go. Your time's up right here. Renew, God. Restore right now, God. And let there be a deliverance, Lord, right now. Hallelujah. Do it right now, God, in your precious name. Hallelujah, God. Heal the body. Make it whole, God.
stop standing. Hallelujah. We're going to let Stacy go ahead and stay here with God. She's in the presence right now. Amen. He's a delivering God. He's a powerful God. All right, listen. Brother Cook's daughter-in-law was in an accident. possible that she could lose a leg with what's happened to her I'm going to go there tomorrow and pray for her but I want to pray that God go before right now before we get there amen her name is Dawn the Bible says he'll take all things and make them work for the good of those that are in Christ Jesus I command in the name of Jesus, Father, all in agreement here that no leg will be lost, God. That you will restore, God. That you hear us right now, God, and that you'll hearken unto the words that we say. Father, I'm begging you at the throne, boldly before God, to save her leg. God, prepare a way tomorrow for her to receive the word as I go there to minister, God. Prepare a way. Guide us on our way to Toledo, Lord. I need you, God. I need you every moment, every breath, God. Thank you for doing that tonight, God. I thank you for what you did here with Stacy, Lord. Father, there's two saints of God from our church, from Calvary Apostolic Church that are in the jail ministry right now. Let your light shine upon them, God. That they would draw all men unto them, God. All women there. That they would all come. That they would come, God, because of the favor that you've bestowed upon them. Do that for Sister Becca right now and Sister Rose, God. We're going to lift your name in that ministry, God. And you're going to draw them, God, that are there to want what, what is here, God. Hallelujah, I'm seeing blue lights right now. Hallelujah, there's a presence in here right now. There's a presence. Listen, anything can happen right now. You just surrender. Thank you, Lord. I have one more request, Lord. You know little Kenny, God, and you know Stephanie. Father, you know that they're on their way here for deliverance. I'm asking you to protect them, God, from where they're coming to here, that they would reach here safely, that you would put a hedge, God, a thick hedge around the children that are coming with them, God, that there would be a powerful, mighty manifestation of your spirit tonight in this place, God. And when they arrive, God, they will know that you're here. God, I pray that you deliver them. I pray that you restore them. I pray, God, that they secure you in their heart. And that they would remain, God, in your presence. And that we'd never walk out, God. I've read too much about walking out of your presence, God. I don't want that. I don't want that for anybody, God. I know, God, what you have prepared for us. No eye has seen and no ear has heard, God, what you have prepared for those that love you. Tonight, God, I love you, and I thank you, Lord. And we pray this in your mighty, mighty, precious name, Jesus. Just worship him right now, saints. Just worship him right now. We got a few minutes to worship him. Let's do that. You're in his presence. Come on.
Hallelujah, hallelujah. I've been so busy today, I have not had the chance to open up my Bible. And I didn't open it up, it just opened up to a scripture right now. I don't know that that's ever happened on my, I didn't even click it to open. And it opened up. I know this, that this is for somebody. Listen. The Lord said read the first five verses. I'm going to read them right now. Don't ever think that something ain't for you. But this is for somebody. Psalm 71. In thee, O Lord, not in myself, in thee, O Lord, not in my brother, not in my sister, in thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. Oh, my God. Listen, you experience this all day and you never know it. There is another voice. We know that God is not the author of confusion. Okay? So there is another voice that we hear in our head. And listen, when I say in my head, it's not like this little devil shows up on your shoulder and starts talking. No, it's in the mind. It is the mind. Let me never be put to confusion. And when you hear that voice, just common sense. We don't need a biography written about how do I do this, Lord? Never be put to confusion. When you hear it and you think it, it's so simple to know that's not God. God would never tell me that. God would never tell me stay away. God would never tell me don't do this no more. If you're in the house of the Lord, it's because you belong here. If you have a calling and God has called you to something, he won't stop. You know, the calling will never leave. The calling of the Lord will never leave. It'll never leave. It'll follow you all your life. And let me tell you something. You could go on out of here and you could walk out right now. And you could have a, 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 a beautiful life. But it would never compare to what the Lord has prepared for them that love him. That life is the life that he's calling you to. That's the life you need to go after. Amen. Listen. Deliver me in thy righteousness. When you hear that voice and it's not right, it's not God. Listen, saints, you guys battle. I do. I do too. I'm including myself. We battle with things that we hear all day, every day. But who succumbs to it? Those that are weak. Those that are weak in the word. Those that are the weak in the walk. Those that are weak in their servanthood to God. Listen. Deliver me in thy righteousness. Not yours. In, in his it's saying. And cause me to escape. Cause me. You know, the other day we talked about impediments. How God will put an impediment in front of you to keep you from making a wrong decision. He won't make you make the right decision, but he'll impede you. And if you're not in the Lord and he's not in you, you'll miss the opportunity. And you'll run right past it. He talks to every one of you every day and every night. It's so simple to know what is God and what isn't God. It's so simple. We get manipulated. We should never be manipulated. The Bible says that he gave us authority and dominion over every living thing on the face of this earth. 
Listen. Incline thy ear unto me and save me. We do that all the time. We cry out to God to save me. But he said, David said, cause me to escape. God isn't going to do it all for you. You got to do some of it. He said, cause me, Lord, make me. Sometimes when we're in a situation or a circumstance and it don't feel good, he's making you to incline his ear to you. He wants you to hear him. He wants you to see him. Listen. Be thou my strong habitation. Whereunto I may continually resort. We run to the doctors the moment that we feel sick. We don't run to God. We don't go to God. For, we run to the cabinet. We run to the cabinet. We run to the doctor. We'll pick up the phone and we'll start to call friends. Hey, do you have any of this? And hey, do you? Be thou my strong habitation. Let me live whereunto I may continually resort. Thou hast given me commandment to save me, for thou art my rock and my fortress. Oh, my God. Deliver me, oh, my God, deliver me out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and the cruel man. For thou art my hope. Last verse. Oh, Lord God, oh, Lord God. Who's his hope? Who's David's hope? O oh Lord God, thou art my trust from my youth. From my youth. When I was a little bitty baby, he was still my hope. Because mom and daddy put something in me that when I would get old, I wouldn't depart from it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hit them lights for me, please. That scripture was for somebody. I've never had that happen. I've been so busy, I haven't been able to read my Bible today, but I prayed a lot because I was on the road a lot. I prayed a lot today. How many spent time with the Lord tonight? Today? Amen. Amen. I don't know what I'd do without him. Amen. All right. I know Brother Cook's got a message. He's got a teaching tonight. Looks like we're going to go a little bit over, but we'll be all right. His messages don't last that long. He's cut them back quite a bit. He's got a wife that cuts it back quite a bit. Amen. All right. Come on up here, brother. God wants us to trust him in everything. We get bad news and we trust to do everything that we want to do to make it right. Take the bad news and put it on the Lord's lap. He said, it's my battle, it's not yours. Anytime you try to, to do something and battle, it becomes yours then. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says it's his battle, not yours. You can't fight a battle. He can't fight a battle if you're fighting it for him. Because he's a sovereign God. And he won't get in the way of what you're trying to do. Go ahead. If you don't want my help, go ahead and fight this battle. But I'm back here. The creator of the world. I'm back here. I'm the one that wrote that it's not your battle. It's mine. I'll take care of it. Whenever you're done trying, I'll come through. Stop. Stop. Give it to him. Give it to him. Amen. All right. Father, take Brother Cook tonight and use his, use his lips, God. Use his wisdom, God, uh, that it would go forth here tonight, God, and it would become your wisdom upon us. Uh, I love you, Lord, and I appreciate you. Just help my brother get through tonight, God. And bless him, God. Bless every word that he says, every scripture. God, let it go deep into the hearts of your people. I thank you, God, for answering prayers tonight. 
I love you, Lord. And we pray this in your precious name. And everybody said amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. And when I make up a lesson, you can be seated. I don't know who's going to be in church. God does, but I don't. So uh, you never know, like he said, uh, who this is for. Actually, it's for everybody. Every time I hear a message, it's all, I always apply it to myself. As if he was speaking directly to me. Because God is. He speaks directly to us. Every time you open your Bible up, the Lord is speaking to you. Amen. That's his word. But today I want to teach a few for a few moments on an interesting portion of scriptures. It's found in the book of Matthew. You know, I'm amazed when I read the New Testament how sometimes when people ask the Lord a question, he seems to answer them in a way that doesn't seem like that he even listened to their question. <laughs> but he gets right to the heart of the matter. So we're going to start out in the book of Matthew chapter 9 and verses 14 through 17. Chapter 9 of Matthew 14 through 17. Then came to him the disciples of John. Now that's disciples of John the Baptist. Saying, why do we? And the Pharisees, who was the religious order of that day, fast oft, but thy disciples fast not. It's a fair question. And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom was with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. Now listen to what else he has to say. Kind of interesting. Does not seem like this applies to what he was talking about. But he said, No man putteth a piece of new cloth unto an old garment. For that which is put in to fill it up taketh from the garment, and the rent is made worse. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. Interesting portion of Scripture. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today is old garments and old bottles. First of all, it's interesting to note that the disciples of John identified themselves with the Pharisees. As far as fasting was concerned, it's a fair question to ask. Since fasting is considered to be, by definition, a formal religious and sacred observance. Meaning that's a common thing among God's people. Amen. This is nothing strange. 
But in answer to their question, I, lo I like it when the Lord answers a question with a question. <laughs> he doesn't beat around the bush, but he gets right to the heart of the matter. So in order to help you understand just what's going on here a little bit, Fasting is and always has been considered to be a former, formal religious and sacred observance. But as far as that goes, so is a wedding ceremony. It's also considered to be a form, formal religious activity and a sacred observance. The difference being, while one is a time of celebration, the other is normally considered to be a time of separation and consecration in preparation for the coming of the Messiah. That's normally why we fast. We fast sometimes for different reasons, but most of the time it's a sobering experience. It's a, uh, it really is uh, meant to kill the flesh. Who likes to go hungry? This flesh likes to eat. Fasting Fasting though was a sacrifice. You're giving up something so that God will give you something in return. Jesus said this, when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, then shall they fast. Now it seems like the disciples of John were still of the same mindset as the Pharisees. In that they had not yet accepted the fact that Jesus was the Messiah. Because if they had accepted him as such, they would have followed him. In fact, John the Baptist said, I'm not him. And they would have became his disciples also. Another interesting point that our Lord mentioned here is a passing of an old covenant. And, and the installation of a new one. But it was cleverly hidden under the guise of old garments and old bottles. It's really interesting. The old saying is, the New Testament is in the old concealed and the old is in the new revealed. But they didn't have, even though they were apostles, I don't think they had the understanding that we do today. We're looking back with a whole new outlook on things. They were always looking forward <coughs> in anticipation of what God was going to do. But we are really blessed because we have a lot of knowledge and understanding and wisdom. All that was required under the Old Testament to be a child of God 
was that a man be circumcised and keep the law. Not just the ceremonial law, but the civil laws and the moral laws as well. That's all that was required. So when the thief on the cross asked Jesus, remember me when you get into your kingdom, he said, this day you will be with me in paradise. You know how he could say that? This man wasn't baptized because he was still under the Old Testament covenant. All he needed to do was believe on the Lord and repent. And I believe he had repented. He told the thief next to him, he said, we're here because we deserve to be here. But this man has done nothing wrong. No, I believe he had a repentant heart. But people, the Bible says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. People need to understand what they're reading when they read the Word of God. It's not given to everybody to understand. It's only given to a select few. It really is. Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. But because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life, few there be that find it. Not everybody's going to make heaven their home. Under the New Testament, in order to become a child of God, you've got to first believe that there is a God. Isn't that what the Bible says? You've got to believe that there is a God and that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. That's the first step. When Jesus gave the commandment, he said, if you want to be my disciple, you must deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. Now, I believe that people back then knew what he was saying. They knew that they were going to have to follow him with that cross, with their cross, Pick up your cross and follow me. They were following him to a place of death. If we can't kill this flesh, we haven't picked up our cross. Simply meaning that the death of the flesh, the death of the flesh brought an end to the old covenant. And a new covenant was birthed after his burial and his resurrection. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 9 for a minute, verse 11 through 17. Hebrews 9, 11 through 17. But Christ, being come an high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, <coughs> neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, 
He is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called, you get that? They which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. A new testament never came into effect until he died on the cross and he resurrected from the dead. And he commanded, one of his last commandments to the apostles was to go and to teach, to baptize, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Jesus had already given the keys to Peter. Now it was up to him to put them to work. But before that could happen, he told them to wait until they were endued with power from on high. While Jesus was physically present with the apostles, they, he did all the work. All they did was observe. They were just following him, watching him, listening to him. They lived in his presence. But after he resurrected from the dead, he said, I'll send the comforter. And he's going to lead and guide you into all truth and righteousness. So Peter didn't get up there on the day of Pentecost and preach by himself. He was anointed with power from on high. Jesus wasn't physically there, but he was there spiritually, living inside of his apostles, directing them, leading them, and giving them words to say. Now, up to this time, they had not been baptized with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. People need to understand that before that time, Jesus had been physically with them. But now Jesus would reside in them, and he can reside in us today, and he will if we'll obey the Scriptures. What we're saying here is that he would now work through the physical bodies of his apostles in the same manner and scope as he did when he was there with them physically. Nothing was going to change as far as their ministry was going to go. But now he would use their bodies, their lips, their hands, their feet to reach people with this message of salvation. Now the keys of the kingdom are repentance. Number one, never get anywhere with God without repentance. Water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And the baptism of the Holy Ghost is evidence by speaking in other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance. This is a supernatural birth. It's the same born-again experience that Jesus told Nicodemus of. And it's just as hard for men to accept today as it was for them back then. As I thought on this lesson today, the Lord put a thought in my head. I, I never had thought to ever really ever say this before. But I think sometimes when people are baptized in Jesus' name and even receive the Holy Ghost, they treat it like it's a get-out-of-jail-free card. Yeah. 
And that's it. And like in Monopoly, you go by and you get out a get out a jail free card. <laughs> that's a wrong mentality to take when you come into the church. You can't come into the church and feel like that. That's why you see a lot of people come and be baptized. Some of them get the Holy Ghost, and then you never see them again. To them, all it was was a get-out-of-jail-free card. There's an old song we used to sing. It's still, you can find it on the Internet today. I can't remember the whole song, only just part of the chorus. It says, everybody wants to go to heaven. How many people you know don't want to go to heaven? But nobody wants to die. Nobody wants to give up the desires of the flesh. They want to hang on to that stuff, and you cannot hang on to that stuff. That's not dying. You can't serve God and mammon, the Bible says. You'll love one and hate the other. It don't work like that. You can't straddle the fence. Either you're in church or you're not. When I came into this thing, I made up my mind. I said, if I'm going to do this, I said my prayer to God. If I'm going to do this, God, I'm not going to quit. What good would that do me? And if I do it, I want to do it right. What good would that do me if I do it wrong? So I had my mind already made up. I didn't care what I had to change in my life. I was going to live for God for the rest of my life, no matter what it took, no matter what I had to change. It did not matter to me. Nothing in this world is worth losing heaven for. Nothing. And God won't force anybody to do anything that they're not willing to. To do. Remember the story of the rich man? Came to the Lord an honest man, but he was rich. But he said, Lord, what shall I do to obtain eternal life? He said, I've kept all the commandments. I mean, he said, I've done this, I've you know, I have never committed adultery. I've never committed murder. You know, I've, I've lived for God all my life. But what am I lacking? And I think it says, one thing thou lackest. Go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor and take up your cross and follow me. Decision time. Imagine yourself being that same rich man. A lot of people in this country don't look at themselves as being rich. But you go overseas in these other countries where they have nothing. You're rich. They consider every American to be rich. Do you know that? They do. They look at you as rich. So you can look at yourself as that same rich man. What would your answer be? You know, he never even answered the Lord. He just says he turned around and walked away sorrowful. And God let him walk away. He did not try to stop him. He didn't run after him and say, hey, hold on a minute. You don't know what you're doing.
when we try to hold on to the things that God don't want us to have, we're doing exactly what the rich man did. So what will you do when you're faced with the prospect of losing everything you've got in this world to follow the Lord? One man asked him, said, I want to follow you, God. And he said, I don't even have a place to lay my head. He said, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but I don't have nowhere to even lay my head. Our Lord was that kind of man. He did not seek after things in this world. He could have came here as a rich man, as a king, but he didn't. He was king already. <coughs> the question is, what are you not willing to part with in order to go to heaven? And I'm telling you, there's nothing in this world worth losing heaven for. Nothing. People put a big stock in the clothes they wear or their hair. Now men want to look like women. They want to be women. Women want to be men. But a big, make it a big issue. It's nothing what your, your hair is going to fall off. So your clothes ain't going to be there after you're gone. You're not taking them with you. So why make a big issue out of things? Why make a big issue out of money? What are you not willing to stop doing? What are you not willing to change? Now, it's up to you. God didn't stop the rich man from walking away sorrowful. He was not a happy man, even though he was rich. It said he walked away Sorrowful. I hope nobody here is willing to walk away like the rich man. Amen. I was just getting ready. Amen. Let's stand. It's amazing because everything you talked about, I haven't talked to you in four or five days, but everything that you talked about has been on my mind for the last four or five days. It is amazing how that happens in the ministry here. It's a unity that I can't even describe it, and I've never seen it in any other church and never heard of it, but it's powerful. Amen? Amen. Uh, the scripture in Matthew says he left sorrowful, and the one in Luke says he left grieved. And at the end of the one in Luke, uh, after he said to sell everything you got, and follow me he, he said before he said and pick up your cross and follow me just what you were talking about in the beginning it was a form of denying yourself right. one of the hardest things that you have to do is deny yourself to get what God is offering nobody wants to do it I used to play marbles when I was in school and there's some marbles that I won I wasn't going to even try to lose them by playing somebody for that marble. I would try to convince them, I got another marble that's almost as nice as that, and I'll play you for that big, nice marble you got. But it's hard to give up 
but I can just tell you from experience, I wouldn't trade everything that God has done with me and through me, and we ain't seen nothing yet. We ain't seen nothing yet what God is fixing to do. Amen. I want to point something out here I was thinking about back here when uh, two things. One is, I don't know I ever heard you speak that loud in the microphone before. <laughs> it was loud. Uh, Angie's smiling and Meg's going, eh. And I know the lady that says, <coughs> tell the bald guy I can't hear him. <laughs> tell the bald preacher I can't hear him. She heard you tonight. Amen. When, when we read uh, that scripture, uh, where were we, brother? Matthew 9? Matthew 9. I think you said 14 through 17. Okay. When they asked him, why do the disciples fast not? This is what I thought back here. Uh, he said, can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? He said, but the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast. I'm going to show you one more thing that it means to fast. This scripture is really a picture of longing for the presence and the return of Christ. Because if you're lacking fasting in your life right now, then that's telling God I'm content without your presence or your return. Think about that. See, when he was with us, it was nice. And, and we get content that he's not here. But fasting, he said, you ain't going to need to fast until I'm gone. And then he was saying, really, it'll be just like when I was here. Because you'll draw my presence. Because that's what fasting does, saints. When you fast, I am telling you, there is a place that you can go. For me, it's after like two and a half days. I enter into something and everything. The clarity of the fast, incredible. And then the voice that you hear. For those of you that have never fast, you're drawing the presence of God back to how it used to be when he walked amongst them. Seek it and look for it, and you'll see it fasting. That's a powerful thing. Amen. All right. Father, I thank you, God, for each and every one that was here tonight. Uh, I love you, Lord. I appreciate your healing powers and authority. Uh, I thank your word, God, uh, that it comes forth and that it pierces our heart and pierces through our ears, God. Uh, even our eyes, when we have scales on them, it makes the scales fall, God. I thank you for that, that you've opened our eyes and opened our hearing tonight, God, to hear spiritually things. God, I'm asking you to go home with each and every one tonight. Travel with them, protect them, God, in their travels, that they may reach their destinations and re return home safely. I'm thankful for your presence here tonight, and I'm thankful for every member that was here tonight. Lord, I love you, and I appreciate you, and we pray this in your precious, mighty 